So it seems like we are starting to slow down with people in the waiting room and most people have been let in or will be in a moment or two. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have um, a really great and exciting topic, um, breaking silos, building systems and looking at CCMV and newborn screening. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, just to let everyone know there is live captioning with this session today. Um, so there's the live captioning and transcription available. To turn the captions on or off or to open the transcript, you can use the small arrow that's in the corner of your live transcription box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we, as I already mentioned, will be recording and this will be available on YouTube in a couple of weeks. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, Brianne and Jamie will be moderate, moderating the chat and they are the ones who know the ins and outs of this. So um, please feel free to um, post your questions there. Um, as we go into today's agenda and objectives, uh, we will start the webinar today with a brief introduction and then have our three panelists present. Um, we will then wrap up with a Q&A session at the end. Uh, you know, for us today, the learning objectives is, you know, understanding what CCMV is and the impact it has on patients and families, to really learn how newborn screening programs and CCMV um, prevention initiatives are currently working together, and to discuss strategies for future collaboration between or the integration of these two systems. So we have our quite the esteemed panel today. I have to say I'm really excited that we were able to get all three of these uh, real um, amazing speakers today. So first we have Amanda Devereaux uh, from the National CMV Foundation, followed by Stephanie McVicker, who is director of the Utah Eddy uh, program. And then we will close out the panel with Lisa Gutlin, who is project director at um, Early Check, um, which is a program at RTI International. Um, they will be presenting on different perspectives and answering different questions um, to the issues around CCMV and newborn screening and where the overlap is and where the discussion has been in the past and where it's going in the future. So now we will be sharing a poll for you to tell us a bit about yourself. Um, this helps us just get a sense of who's uh, in the virtual room, as they say. Um, so we'll give you all a, a moment of, you know, 10 to 15 seconds to uh, fill this out. Thank you. We have a good portion of people from newborn screening uh, or laboratory representatives, uh, a good number of CCMV or EDI program representatives. Um, looks like we have a couple parents, a couple healthcare providers, um, some advocacy organization providers, a nice mix uh, coming in. So thank you. Um, so we have um, a couple of other polls that will be coming out throughout the session today. So definitely keep an eye out for that. So we wanted to set the stage a bit as to what, you know, why are we having this uh, discussion today. Why, why did we decide to um, host this, this panel? Um, we know that CCMD is a hot topic both in the scientific literature and in the news in recent years and even more so in um, recent months as we saw. Uh, the image on the left is um, looking at um, articles that have been um, put through through PubMed and it shows this really rapid increase over the last decade. You know, I think we've all kind of thought, oh, well, there's more of a discussion, but to see it in this format is really telling. 
Um, and then on the, so that's the scientific community um, increasing its discussion of these topics. Um, but then, which I think is equally, if not more interesting, is on the right, it shows um, news headlines. And what has been really interesting is that three out of the four of these headlines were not even from the past year, but in the past month, with one of them being from last week, the one that's about um, Minnesota um, is you know, highlighting a bill that was introduced very recently. And if it would pass, um, making Minnesota the first state with universal CCMB screening and you know what that means. So I think that this slide really showcases that, wow, it really has been, it is quite a time to be having this conversation. So when we are looking at this session today, um, we really want to see and understand, you know, the state of collaboration between these different communities over time um, to participate in and encourage ongoing discussion and for there to be the opportunity to answer and ask critical questions about collaboration. Um, you know, for us, it isn't about um, you know, trying to change anyone's mind or encourage perspectives one way or the other, but really to provide an opportunity for multiple stakeholders to come together, to hear from each other. Again, it's why I'm really excited about this panel um, to have some different perspectives talking about this and really to invite all stakeholders to the table to encourage ongoing discussion. Um, we know that we don't have all the answers. We don't know exactly how everything will pan out and that's okay. It's really about sharing strategies and sharing the different questions that um, um, that we all have as both of these systems and initiatives are, are evolving. So with that, I would like to have um, Amanda kind of take it away with her presentation. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. I agree with you, this is such a timely topic and it's really, um, we're just so happy to be a part of this conversation. And so, like you said, I work for the National CMV Foundation as the program director. And the mission, the, the new mission of the National CMV Foundation is to prevent pregnancy loss, childhood death, and disability due to congenital CMV. You can go to the next slide. So just the discussion points I want to cover. What is cytomegalovirus or CMV and what is congenital CMV, which we abbreviate as CCMV? We want to talk about the impact of that on, on families and the healthcare system a little bit. What do families with this diagnosis experience? And what is the current state of CMV screening in the United States? Next slide. So what is CMV, cytomegalovirus? So long name, um, hard to say. <laughs> um, if you ever see news stories about this, a lot of times it's, it's not pronounced correctly. So um, I think that that works against us a little bit actually. Um, but it is a, a common virus, um, a DNA virus in the herpes family, but it is not herpes. And most infections are silent. So most people who get this are not going to know that they have it. Every once in a while, I will hear about someone who did have a significant reaction um, or significant symptoms. But for the most part, in healthy individuals, they're going to have this and, and not really even know it. And again, like I said, this is common. So 50 to 80% of adults have been exposed by the time that they're 40. This is something that doesn't, shouldn't be stigmatized or anything like that because people are passing this around frequently, especially children. Up to 80% of healthy children are shedding the virus at any given time. And so it's a very common virus in young children, um, toddlers, kids in daycare, they're swapping around those germs and, and this virus is definitely there. Next slide, please. So how is it transmitted? Um, the risk of transmission through casual contact is pretty small. We're mainly talking about spreading this through urine and saliva. So probably somebody that you spend a lot of time with, somebody that you're caring for. The virus is mainly transmitted through the urine and saliva and toddlers are hot zones. So toddlers are definitely spreading this around. Um, it's thought to be a way that pregnant women are catching this is either from their own children in their home or children that they're caring for if, if they're not taking the proper precautions. So again, it's, it's something that is, is passed around frequently. The virus can also be transmitted from mother to baby during pregnancy. 
And so the most common cause, like I've said before, for the pregnant woman to catch this is thought to be from a child less than the age of three. And if a pregnant woman catches the virus, she has about a one in three chance of passing it to the, to the developing baby. Next slide, please. So what is congenital CMV or CCMV? When the expectant mother catches the virus, she can pass it through the placenta to the developing baby. And when a baby is infected with CMV before birth, it is called congenital CMV. So CCMV, that's the abbreviation. Overall, about one in 200 infants are born with CCMV, and one in five of these infants will have a birth defect or a permanent health condition. So we're looking at an instance of um, health conditions and birth defects um, from congenital CMV in about one out of every 1,000 births in the United States. And this makes CMV the most common infectious cause of birth defects, um, more common than many things that many pregnant women have heard of. Next slide, please. So this is just a slide that kind of can illustrate um, the contrast between some of the viral causes of birth defects. So we've got Zika virus on here, rubella, and then CMV. And you can see it's also got a map that kind of shows where these are happening. And Zika is really um, situated in South America and um, you know the Southern part of North America and transmitted by mosquitoes and got a lot, lot of press coverage and a lot of funding for that virus. But um, when the CDC was tracking the number of birth defects caused by Zika, there were about 203 total in the United States in 2018 by, by that point. And I've actually heard recently that, that they're not tracking this um, anymore. So not, obviously the Zika virus was extremely impactful to those who are affected and it is a huge deal and we should be talking about it. But if we go over and look at CMV, we're talking about an instance rate of um, that is much more frequent, one in 200 births, like we said, and thousands of birth defects caused each year by congenital CMV. So this is just a nice slide to really see the contrast. And then we've got rubella in the middle here where we don't really see um, that many birth defects caused by rubella anymore because of vaccination. So um, just a good illustration that if we can get a CMV vaccine, we would hopefully see quite a decrease in the number of birth defects caused. Next slide. So again, what is the impact um, in a little more detail? One in 200 babies, if we apply that to um, birth rates in the United States, um, current birth rates, it's about 20,000 babies per year born with the virus. And then, like I said, one in five of those babies have a permanent health condition. 90% of infants are asymptomatic at birth. So they look typical and there's probably no concerns um, and you can't really tell that, they're, that they've been born with the virus. But interestingly, even the infants born with symptoms are not usually identified. Greater than 90% of infants born with symptomatic CMV, CCMV are not identified. So unfortunately, we're not very good at identifying even the symptomatic children. Like I said, about one out of every five babies born with the virus is going to have a consequence from the virus, and this could show up months or years later. So um, some infants are born, they pass their hearing test, and then years later, they may start losing their hearing. And if we um, use the, the birth rate, um, the, the current birth rate for the United States, it's about 4,000 birth defects or permanent health conditions in the United States every year. Now, um, just to note about asymptomatic children, there used to be um, some thought that these children are not very likely to have um, any consequences of congenital CMV, but just recently there was a paper that was published that nearly half of children with asymptomatic congenital CMV end up with a vestibular gaze or balance disorder. So I think the point of this is we really don't know the full impact of asymptomatic um, congenital CMV yet. And so more research is definitely needed on, on that. Next slide. So there's a spectrum of symptoms with congenital CMV. It's really hard sometimes to narrow down exactly where an infant or a child falls on this spectrum, but um, children who are born with severe symptoms um, tend to have severe consequences and children born with less um, obvious symptoms tend to have less serious consequences. So it goes all the way from being born with the virus and never having any consequences from that all the way to stillbirth, miscarriage, child and infant death, 
and then kind of everything in between. Hearing loss, developmental delays, cerebral palsy, seizures. These are things that a lot of CMV families are dealing with. And so there really is a wide spectrum of how this is going to impact those children. Next slide. What's the economic impact? I read a paper recently that, that we don't have a very good handle on what is the economic impact, but what we have is a couple studies that were published um, um, quite a while ago in the 1990s. It was estimated that congenital CMV costs 1.9 billion annually to the United States, and the average cost per affected child is $300,000 annually. Of course, with some costing more and some costing less, but um, that was the average. And then there was an interesting presentation in Vermont at the CMB conference that privately insured children with who are di who have a diagnosis of CCMB have four-year expenditures um, greater than 20 times as great as other privately insured U.S. children. So the cost is high, but I don't know that we have completely accurate numbers on what the cost is yet. And the costs are, are there's a wide range of, of things that contribute to this cost. Um, medication, hospitalizations, therapy, cochlear implants, special education, um, all sorts of things that kind of contribute to that cost. So these are things that families dealing with a congenital CMV diagnosis are, are dealing with. Next slide. So what do we know about prevention? Per the CDC, pregnant women may be able to lessen their risk of acquiring CMV during the pregnancy, so their chance of catching the virus. So there is um, research that if pregnant women take precautions, they can reduce their risk of catching CMV during the pregnancy. Prevention has been, I would say, hindered by this sense that there's nothing we can do about this or this is unavoidable. Or if we talk to pregnant women about this, we're going to add to their stress level. But there have been several studies showing that the hygienic measures work. They can reduce the risk and no adverse events were noted where women were, you know, extremely stressed by the recommendations. It's important to note that several states already have laws mandating that pregnant women be provided CMB education materials, particularly in the first trimester. And a 2015 ACOG, um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists practice bulletin called Prevention Measures Impractical or Burdensome. So those, um, those prevention measures are not being taught um, consistently by providers. Next slide, please. These are our five simple steps um, that we think pregnant women should take to lessen their risk of catching CMB during the pregnancy. Avoiding contact with saliva when kissing a child. So we say, kiss them on the top of the head or give them a hug instead of kissing them on the lips. Don't put a pacifier in your mouth. Don't share food, utensils, drinks, or straws. Don't share a toothbrush and wash your hands carefully after changing a diaper. We're trying to avoid the urine and saliva. And sometimes people say to me, well, these are obvious and I, everyone should be doing these anyway. And, I, and sometimes I'll hear people say, well, I always tell my patients that they should be using good hygiene during pregnancy. And, and those, those things might be true, but I think pregnant women, if they don't know that there is a real significant consequence it's easy to forget these things. If you're a busy mom, you're running around, you've got a toddler, you're cooking dinner, you're doing all these things. It's real easy to just take a bite of that kid's sandwich or, or share a drink with them. So we just want people to be aware of the rest so that they can take simple steps to prevent CMV. Next slide. We do have an awareness problem with CMV. Um, I've heard it called an awareness gap and I, I like that phrasing. And one of our scientific advisory committee members um, helped to make this graph to kind of illustrate this. And so if we look at the orange dots, those are the number of children disabled by the disorder each year. So we can see CMV is around 6,000, about the same as Down syndrome. And then we go to something that people have heard of a lot more frequently, like let's say toxoplasmosis. Um, OBGYNs are always talking to their patients about avoiding toxoplasmosis, um, you know, not changing the kitty litter. And that is very, very low incidence. The number of times that pregnant women catch that um, and pass it to their babies is, is really low. But the awareness in the blue bars we can see is, um, is also pretty, um, is, is, on, is kind of on the same level. So we can see for congenital CMV, the orange dot 6,000 births, but the awareness is less than 10%. So that's the gap 
we've got very low awareness and more of a high incidence where some of the other conditions um, that everybody's heard of don't happen very often. And so this is an area where we'd like to see some improvement. Next slide. What is the current status of CMB screening? Well, in the United States, there's nothing um, consistent. It's all um, across the board and it depends on where you are. It's important to note out that most infants, probably greater than 95% of children born with congenital CMV are never identified. So several states have started mandating screening. And so I think that there's six states that mandate screening. Um, and Stephanie will talk about Utah, the, the first one. And so most of this screening has been centered on if they fail the newborn hair and screening, then we screen for CMV. Um, the National CMB Foundation has submitted a recommended uniform screening panel or RUS nomination package. Um, we did get some basic feedback on that and we will be resubmitting. We did not have a full review yet, so um, we are looking forward to resubmitting that and getting a full review so that we can get the feedback. Currently, um, congenital CMV is more common than the 29 combined metabolic and endocrine disorders on the recommended uniform screening panel. So this would be something that is much more common than, than most things that are on um, the recommended screening panel at this point. So no state has universal CMV screening yet. Um, there's a couple bills pending this session um, in Minnesota and Massachusetts. Um, Kentucky submitted a universal bill this year. Indiana submitted a universal bill this year. Um, so we'll just have to see where, where those um, end up. Next slide. So what is the typical family experience um, regarding a CMV diagnosis? Well, you can see that these, these circles aren't exactly to scale, but um, we do have some families who contact us. They've had a miscarriage or a stillbirth and they get a diagnosis of CMV. We do get families contacting us in the neonatal period. So right shortly after birth, um, they get a diagnosis. We do get um, moms contacting us who are pregnant and get a diagnosis during pregnancy. And then we also have families who find out after their baby is kind of out of that newborn phase. So, um, and I'll share a story in a few minutes um, that kind of illustrates that. But I think the most important thing here is that most families never get a CMV diagnosis. So that's why that, that circle is so big. Um, most children who end up with consequences from this are going to find out later and they're not going to be able to go back and, and tie that to CMV. So they're not going to know that that was the cause of um, the child's disability or the health condition. So families are experiencing this a number of different ways, but most families are not getting a diagnosis. Next slide. So what's a typical family experience when they get a diagnosis? Again, this is a little different for every family, um, but we do have some common themes. And I was really appreciative a study came out of the UK this year, or maybe last year, that tried to um, you know, quantify or um, you know, get these feelings down and, and publish what CMV families go through because they really go through a lot. And so these are just some common themes that we hear. Um, people are frustrated by the diagnostic odyssey. So their child doesn't has um, hearing loss and they don't know why, and they figure out it's not genetics and they go to all these different specialists. And finally someone says, well, what about CMV? And then it's too late to test or maybe they are able to go back and find the blood spot and get tested. And so they're on this diagnostic odyssey for months or years to try and figure out what happened. And families are upset by that. They're upset by their dis the dismissal of their concerns. So they are told by people from the beginning, oh, it's probably nothing. This isn't going to be a big deal. You know, I, I've, I've never had any other families that delivered a baby with CMB. So it's, it's something that, that doesn't happen very often. Don't worry about it. Um, and during pregnancy, if they if they ask about it or if they ask their OB, um, they they get a lot of pushback and, and dismissal. People refer to it as the loss of a dream. People feel really let down by the medical community. They feel like they they should have known about this. They're frustrated because their doctors don't know what this is and they don't know um, you know where to direct them and what to do. Families are really angry and resentful about missed opportunities for both CMV prevention as well as early diagnosis and treatment. 
they find out a month or year later and they months or years later and they feel like they missed a chance to intervene early. The children have an uncertain future and that, that makes them very uncomfortable. And then finally, the number one thing families say to me is they say, why didn't anyone tell me about this? And I would say that that's the thing that I hear over and over and over again. And that's the exact same question that I asked my OB when I was diagnosed during my pregnancy. I said, why didn't anyone tell me about this? I would have, I would have done something different. So I think that that's a really important thing. Next slide. I have a very quick story. I know I'm, I'm running short on time, but I wanted to share Ryder's story um, quickly. And it's important to note, he, is, he was born in a state that has targeted um, CMV screening for infants who fail their hearing screening. So this is a, just a good illustration about, um, you know, how these kids can be missed. So he was born in July, 2018. He passed his hearing screening on the third try. And his mom just is not sure if he really, <laughs> really passed that or not. But he was born with the petechiae, eyes, so he had these little spots kind of all over his body, but they were pretty subtle. She asked about it, was told it was no big deal, nothing. He was not tested for CMV. At age one, he had hearing loss, went to a neurologist, had white matter changes on his brain, and the neurologist was the one who said, maybe you need to get the blood spot and get it tested. And luckily, he lived in a state where they kept it. They tested it, and it was positive for CMV. His mom just shared a quote with me. She said, we only got the CMV diagnosis because we pushed and pushed for a cause of the hearing loss. So he missed out on possible antiviral treatment, follow-up hearing testing, and early intervention. Next slide. So collaboration, um, I know we'll talk about this, but I, I think our biggest ask is just talk about this. If, if you can't do fully implement screening right now, that's okay. Just have the conversation, try and figure out the plan, talk about this so that it's on people's radars, stay up to date, and then learn from others. Um, there's plenty of people out there who will help you figure out how to make a plan for this in your state. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Amanda, um, both for really setting the stage in terms of when we are talking about CMV and CCMV, what do we really mean by that? So we're having shared terminology as well as those family experiences and you know, really why we're having this discussion. Um, so next I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie McVicker and I am the Utah Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Programs Manager and I am at the Department of Health, and one of the programs is our congenital CMB public health initiative, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, next slide. So we actually have three EDI programs. We have EDI, so newborn hearing screening and its follow-up, and our congenital CMB public education and testing program, and our children's hearing aid program. And so I oversee the three programs that are in our state law involving audiology. And my clinical background is I am an audiologist. Next. Just real quick, this is the mission and vision of the Utah Department of Health. Next slide. And our strategic priorities. We have, to, we have to put those in in every presentation. Next slide. So let's go back in time about eight years ago. So in 2013, Utah passed the first CMV law and it was two folds. It established a public education program and also a testing program. And it charged the Department of Health, AKA my program myself, to create the programs. It was signed into law almost exactly eight years ago to this week. Um, we also were specified certain groups that we had a, to supply congenital CMV information to. Mostly it was women of childbearing age. Next slide. Here are just some of the large scale public awareness campaigns that I've run over the past several years. We've had billboards across our interstate and in English and Spanish, depending on the area. We've had transit campaigns with awareness ads on the outside and inside of our buses and trains. The, the top left, again, we want to hit our demographics. So we did a lot of advertising and sporting programs for our universities. And the top one was for University of Utah, Utah football program. And then the next slide shows a few more of our other efforts that we have done over the past several years. Next slide. And there you can see some more there. Okay, next slide. 
So let's talk about the second part of our law. This is our testing portion. And so in the law, it's written that a medical practitioner must test a baby for CMV before 21 days if they fail their newborn hearing screenings. It was also written that the medical provider had to speak to the parents and talk to them about CMV. Next slide. And then UDOH, Utah Department of Health, um, we had to be charged with providing information to the family and the medical provider about the fact that the baby failed their newborn hearing screening and how they can get the testing done. Next slide. So we wrote rules to clarify the law, and one of them was to clarify what does it mean to fail newborn hearing screening. We are a two-stage state, and I'm going to show an illustration of that in just a second. So we define failing the newborn hearing screening is failing the first screening as an inpatient in hospital, and then the repeat outpatient screening if baby failed at the first stage. So if the baby failed both of those screenings, they're to be tested for CMV, or if they fail their very first newborn hearing screening and they're already 14 days of age, if they fail that screening, they need to be tested for CMV. Next slide. So babies are tested in the hospital. If they don't pass the first screening, they'll be rescreened for hearing right before discharge. Then they're to return as an outpatient, really no later than seven to 10 days of age for a repeat newborn hearing screening. Next slide. So when they come back, their hearing is rescreened. If they fail at that time, two things are to happen. They get referred to a pediatric audiologist for their diagnostic audiology exam, which is an auditory brain stem response or ABR. And they're also referred to the lab to have their CMV testing done. It has to be done before 21 days of age because critical time window where we can differentiate between a genital infection or an acquired infection. And so sometimes a baby can get CMV through the birth canal or maybe from the mother's breast milk, and that would be an acquired infection. And what we're looking for is a congenital infection. So if they're tested before 21 days and it's positive, we know the baby was infected congenitally. Now our CMV PCR testing is done on urine or saliva only. The caveat for saliva is that the swab shouldn't be taken until uh, two hours or more after ingestion of breast milk. We don't want to have any false positives occur. Next slide. Um, we did write a rule about special populations of newborns. So when our law was passed, there was a little bit of pushback from the medical community. And one of the groups that I had met with were neonatologists, and they were concerned about compliance with the law because they said many of their babies wouldn't even have a newborn hearing screening before 21 days of age. So I talked with them, worked with them. You want to get your partners on board as soon as possible. And we wrote the rule together to give them a caveat, where if a baby can't have their newborn hearing screening before 21 days. It's up to the provider to decide whether or not to test them for CMV. Next slide. There also was a reporting requirement. Now remember the way the law was written, the family had to, once they failed their newborn hearing screening, get referred back to their pediatrician who then would talk to the family about CMV, order the test, then the family would go to the lab and get the testing done. Pediatrician got the results and then they had a send the results to us at the Department of Health. So as you can see, that was a very complicated system and it turns out it really wasn't the best and it's gotten a lot better over time and I'll share what we've done. Next slide. So when we started the mandate, um, I had a couple of hypotheses on what could happen. And the national eddy milestones are called the one through six. Every baby born in the states and territories should have their hearing screened before one month of age. That's the one. They don't pass. They need to have a diagnosis of typical or atypical hearing before three months of age. And then if they are diagnosed with atypical hearing, they need to be enrolled in early intervention prior to six months. That's the one through six. So now in Utah, we didn't have one month. We needed to get our baby screened and then rescreened if needed before a half a month. So I wondered, is our diagnostic, our three month milestone going to improve? Are our timelines gonna be better just from the mere fact that we're pushing the babies through the eddy process a little bit sooner? And here's a little bit of data that I put together. This was from the first five years of our mandate. And by the end of year five with our CMV law in place, the average age of our diagnostic milestone attainment was just under one month of age. So remember the diagnostic milestones 
three months of age. And after five years of the mandate, we were down to every baby being diagnosed pretty close to the one month mark. So that was really exciting. Next slide. Another thing that was really exciting is we noticed over time that a, a lot of NICU babies were being tested for congenital CMV. And I think there was top of mind awareness about congenital CMV in the medical community where they were starting to think more about babies that could be missed because they're not getting early testing. And so we noticed there was a steady increase. And if you click the button, about in 2016, a group of, go ahead and, there we go, there was a recommendation, a best practice recommendation put forth to the neonatologists about testing NICU infants if they had any of these criteria. And again, this will be recorded, so you'll be able to see that in more detail. But that was really exciting. We started to see more testing being done unrelated to failing newborn hearing screening. Next slide. Now, one of the challenges is, and it's still a challenge, is trying to get babies born out of hospital to have their CMV testing done. And over time, um, it, it showed improvement, but we're still making slow and steady gains. It's not where we want it to be. And when we speak with our midwives, uh, one of the barriers that they continually talk to us about is the cost, because many of their clients are not insured. And CMV testing is not paid for by the state, so that can be a barrier and their parent, um, their patients aren't willing to, to pay for the test. It's, it's out of their realm of economic situation. And what I put on there about the 90% for newborn hearing screening is it took us 20 years in Utah to get 90% of our out of hospital birth infants tested for hearing. Um, but I, I can't wait that long. These babies need to have that testing. So we're continually still working on that. So next slide. Um, just to let you know, for the first five years, we were pretty split. Half the babies were tested by saliva, half were tested by urine. Um, in the past three years, there's been an increase in urine testing, and now we're about 79% of our babies do just have urine testing versus saliva. Because our saliva-tested babies, we do do a confirmatory urine just to be sure that the, the baby's positive and there wasn't any sort of in, interference from breast milk. So if you go to the next slide... Um, this is really exciting. So dry blood spots. In the beginning, we were asked, how come we're not testing the dry blood spots? Well, back several years ago, the data was showing that the testing that was done was very insensitive for picking up congenital cytomegalovirus. And so it wasn't a viable option at that time. But since then, there's been wonderful researchers that have been working on this. And actually, Dr. Sheila Dollard and her group from the CDC in conjunction with the University of Minnesota, they've been studying dry blood spots. And this was just published last month. And if you click the button, they found a much higher sensitivity. It wasn't 30%. It was more like 86%. So it's very exciting for possibly having universal CMV testing. That's going to be a wonderful tool. And I just want to say we have a, a really great relationship with our public health laboratory. They're awesome. And if we have consent from the patients and the parents for the babies, if a baby is tested for congenital CMV and for whatever reason, it wasn't done within 21 days and they test positive. So let's say the baby's two months old and they test positive. Well, we didn't meet the 21 day window. With consent, we can, we can, um, sorry, I get distracted when there's a chat coming up. Um, we can send it to the lab and they will send the heel stick and we will test it for congenital CMV. And several times we have picked up positive cases by utilizing that partnership. So that's been a wonderful thing. Next slide. And I just wanted to show you, you know, there definitely was a ramping up time on the mandate. You know, in the beginning, some providers thought it was optional, the testing, and it took a while for people to get on board. But now we made very nice progress. Really, within the first three years, we were up over 90% uh, of the eligible babies being tested. And if you go to the next slide, I'm just going to quickly hit... Um, I know I'm almost out of time. A couple of essential things that really helped improve the process for families were we had a dedicated CMV data coordinator who, who tracked down the babies. We ran weekly reports to find out who was eligible that week. She would reach out to the families and she would reach out to the 
primary care providers to facilitate the testing. We also created a standing order. We didn't have to go through the process that was created in the beginning, where when the baby failed newborn hearing screening at the time they became eligible, we have a standing order where that family goes right to the lab and gets it done. And if you go to the next slide, it shows you an example of our standing order. It has information for the family. It has all the correct lab ordering information on the bottom, making sure that it's either on saliva or urine. And it also at the same time orders the diagnostic ABR. Okay, into the home stretch here, next slide. Um, we've done CMV report cards. We do them on an annual basis. So hospitals know how well they're performing. If you click, you can get through a couple more images of some of the data that's provided to the hospitals, next. Okay, and next slide. Um, we, we can skip through. The, basic, the, ba the, the point of this slide was that there was a large hospital corporation where they were still struggling with their babies getting tested on time. And so we did reach out and work with their corporate compliance office and they put protocols in for all of their hospitals. They even put our standing order and electronic medical record and it really made all the difference to move the needle in getting these babies tested. So just an FYI as an idea. Next slide. So this slide shows the number of children we've identified. Basically, we identified two per hundred of every baby we test based on the failure of newborn hearing screening. And so the orange bars show the number that have been tested only because of our mandate. The blue shows the ones who have been tested for some of the NICU protocols. And then this huge spike that you see in 2020 is because we created a high risk testing protocol and it started being enacted by several of the hospitals right at the end of 2019. And so many more babies were tested by hospitals following the protocol that you can see there was a huge increase of detected congenital CMV cases. Next slide. And this is just a copy of our protocol. And if you click again, you'll just see the risk factors, the 11 risk factors that are on our sheet. So next slide. Okay, so a couple of highlights on the last slides here. Congenital CMV is now a qualifying diagnosis for early intervention in our state. We also have found a better way to get lab testing results. So automatically any baby who's under one year of age that's tested for CMV, we will get a copy of the results. And like I mentioned before, there's increased overall awareness about congenital CMV in the medical community. Next slide. And um, we also now have a multidisciplinary congenital CMV clinic, a one-stop shop for our families to come where they get to see ENT, neurology, infectious disease, ophthalmology, audiology, all in one place. Next slide is my contact information and I'll be here for questions, but we, we don't have a lot of time. So please feel free to reach out if I can be of help to you in any way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for uh, not just talking about where you are today, but what it took to get here. Um, and with that, I will pass it along to Lisa. Hello, can you all hear me? My audio? Great, thank you, Natasha. Thanks for the opportunity to um, present here today. Um, and thanks, Stephanie and Amanda, for a great presentation. So I'm going to talk about the Early Check Research Study and specifically talk about um, our decision-making and how we've been thinking about um, making the decision to whether to add congenital cytomegalovirus virus to our screening panel. Next slide. So first, the Early Check. Early Check is funded by a combination of federal advocacy and commercial support. Next time, next slide. So I'm gonna give you a very short, um, uh, description of what early check is and then I'm going to talk about our decision making process for screening and I'm going to um, make sure to end so that we have um, five minutes at the end at least for questions. Next slide. So um, you know when when policymakers are making decisions about what conditions should be included in newborn screening when I when I say newborn screening I mean universal newborn screening, there really is a need for high quality evidence to make those decisions. That's particularly the case for some of the um, conditions included in newborn screening that are quite rare. Of course, CCMV um, is much more common as um, Amanda 
um, talked about, but there really is, um, in order to make important decisions about screening, there needs to be high quality evidence. And we proposed and built the early check research study as one solution to that problem. And we intend it to be a research infrastructure that will allow research um, to inform policy for diff many different types of rare conditions. Next slide. So Early Check is a North Carolina partnership. Um, I uh, work at RTI International, which is a large nonprofit research institute. And the North Carolina partnership with the North Carolina State Laboratory of Public Health, where standard newborn screening is completed, as well as divisions of public health in our state, as well as the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Duke University, and Wake Forest. And it's a research study. So unlike, um, in the 70s presentation talking about targeted screening, this is a research study and it's not part of public health newborn screening. But a research study is designed to try and develop and evaluate methods to offer screening, um, voluntary screening of newborns for a panel of conditions that are not on state newborn screening yet. And we really would like to acquire data that will inform um, newborn screening policymakers. And we really envision this as a long-term resource where conditions could come on and off the panel and possibly for an envisioned future where states might offer a voluntary panel of non-RUSP conditions. So perhaps we could be a model for states that might ultimately um, choose to implement something like this. Next slide. So just some very brief slides about what we are. We have multiple methods of low touch statewide outreach. So we have very little direct interaction with participants recruiting. The um, North Carolina Division of Public Health sends a letter to every birthing mom, introducing them to the study. We have a social media ad campaign. We have um, information in healthcare settings, and we are also inviting participants um, to enroll their newborn in um, through patient portals at UNC and Duke. And then we actually did very recently start some in-person recruitment at both Duke and UNC. Next slide. So just like we have low touch outreach, we have low touch consent. Consent is obtained um, purely through an online portal and we talk to very, very few of the moms who um, enroll their newborn. Of course, they have ways to contact us, but we talk to very few of them. Next slide. And no additional specimen is needed. And this is, you know, really a um, result of our key partnership with the North Carolina State Lab is that early check laboratory testing is done using the same specimen used for standard newborn screening. And we use it when it's finished and use the leftover specimen. So really this allows us um, to have the really large scope that we hope to have this large statewide scope. Next slide. And then Although we don't talk to most moms who enroll their newborn, obviously there's a lot more engagement with um, babies who test positive and there's confirmatory testing and follow-up through our clinical partners at UNC and Duke. You can see here, these are the three conditions that are currently on the um, early check panel. Next slide. So all newborns in North Carolina are, ed are eligible. Um, you can see we have a really nice statewide spread. We also have some um, babies from South Carolina, primarily um, moms who are coming to North Carolina to give birth, for example, in, um, in Charlotte. And since we launched, we have over 13,500 families that have enrolled their newborn in early check. Next slide. So how do we decide what to screen for? So this was, um, we first started talking about this in 2016, 2017 originally. We knew we um, wanted the panel of conditions. We had ideas of what we wanted to screen for, but we wanted a process that was not arbitrary, but that was instead um, transparent and um, based on an set of established criteria so that we could then make decisions in the future for other conditions. Next slide. So these are our criteria. They look very similar to some of um, the criteria that policymakers use for standard newborn screening. We wanted serious um, conditions, childhood onset, um, some sort of 
um, certainty that there might be a net benefit for the child and family. And then we needed a test that could be performed on dry blood spots because um, we use the lecture of the dry blood spot from the state. Next slide. And then finally, we had some practical considerations, really things like, you know, do we have the clinical expertise to perform follow-up? Do advocates support screening for a condition? Um, to like, you know, what research question do we want to answer? And then, you know, finally, just whether funding was available for that particular condition. Next slide. So we had a process where we um, had a large um, group of disorders that had established um, drug blood spot assays. We compared it against our criteria and came up with some candidates. Um, and you can see some of them here. Next slide. And so congenital cytomegalovirus, so we considered it at the very beginning. We um, thought it was a good candidate. It would be an infectious etiology, which really would demonstrate um, sort of diversity in our panel compared with other genetic conditions. The, um, there have very recently been publications in New England Journal about the treatment, early treatment um, of children with CCMD with antivirals. Um, but, you know, we really were concerned because the dry blood spot assay was not optimal. Um, really, the preferred specimen type was saliva and or urine. And we just, we were not going to be collecting those specimens. And then we were also worried about how many babies would we, we would identify. Next slide. So really, it came down to two primary reasons, is that one is the follow-up burden. Um, we didn't know how many people would sign up for early check. And, you know, we are not a state newborn screening program. Um, that partners with providers, right? We're a research study that we wanted to make sure that we could adequately follow up all the babies we identified. Um, and we were concerned that we wouldn't be able to do that. And then secondly, that there was not a great test in red blood spot. And it just, um, for those two reasons, we decided not to include CCMV at that time. Next slide. So these are some future conditions. You see congenital cytomegalovirus. We are not screening for CCMV yet. Um, I guess the other conditions that are the closest in the planning stages are the, the bottom one, the chromosome 15 condition. Next slide. So what has changed now? So now we are, we are very seriously planning for and um, seeking funding to add CCMV to early check. And in terms of two things really have changed is that one is the improved dry blood spot assay um, that um, Stephanie um, reported on from Drs. Dollard at CDC and Dr. Schleiss at um, University of Minnesota. And then next slide. You know, and then really that, um, that we will, um, we have a better estimation of what our follow-up will burden will be because of um, our uptake rate. And we've had success following up these three conditions for the last several years and really feel confident in our ability to follow up, to set up a system to follow up lots more babies um, that, um, since CCMV is so much more common. Next slide. So just briefly, because I want, do want to give us um, chance for questions, but you know this decision making has been in the context of re a research study, right? And our intent is that you know we will generate evidence that will inform um, universal newborn screening. So you know we will generate evidence on um, testing a follow up system statewide. We have a very virtual. Um, follow-up system, just like our consent process with a lot of telegenetic counseling, um, tele-interaction. We were going to study how to best report back this information to families and how to communicate that uncertainty that comes with this diagnosis. Um, we can assess if we're doing some families harm by identifying kids who will never have clinical sequela. And then we could also understand um, access to surveillance. Next slide. You know, so in summary, really, I think my primary, you know, uh, I think CCMV is an, is an excellent candidate for universal newborn screening, but I think that key is high quality data um, generated by multiple types of programs, including targeted screening, including 
um, screening like the University of the Minnesota study, studies like early check, but also, you know, other types um, um, of either pilots or, um, you know, studies of families with CCMV is that I really think that the, the that generating and having a focus on generating really high quality data will allow um, an incredibly informed decision. And then that is um, um, one of the most important things that we can do to um, inform decision making about universal CCMV screening. So I didn't quite make it with five minutes, but I made it almost. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, really appreciate that. Um, so we have just a few more minutes and to, to let our participants know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will have a couple of polls pop up um, and would really appreciate if you can fill those out. Um, you know, one question that I saw come up that I believe was for um, Stephanie was about um, for NICU babies um, that, um, you know, have been in the unit. Uh, do you feel that greater than 21 one days is um, it says is acquired at that point. I don't know if that um, do you understand that question? This is Stephanie. We have come across some babies who have acquired um, CMV in the NICU. Um, I would say probably a handful we've come across that turns out that they that it was acquired. So it. It's a ubiquitous virus, so sometimes even with the best infection controls, that can happen. So we, we do see that from time to time. Great, thank you. Um, one question that um, you know we've been thinking about and would love the thoughts of all of uh, the panelists is, you know, what does success look like for collaboration between CCMV initiatives and newborn screening programs? And I guess with that, I will start with Amanda and we can just go down the row. Um, for me, I think at this point, success is just having a conversation and talking to people about this and, and trying to kind of make the connections and, and figure out what you in your institution or your state, what you guys can be doing. Because um, sometimes what we hear about CMB is, um, well, first of all, we hear a lot of people who don't realize the impact or how common it is. But we also hear people say, well, there's nothing we can do about that. We can't do that. But everybody can do something. So I think success right now is just having those conversations in your state or in your institution. OK, so for me, collaboration is all about communication and just uh, making sure we all know what the other person is doing. And so, for example, it was a perfect fit to be part of the EDI program because it was tied to newborn hearing screening and has such a large association, unfortunately, with childhood hearing loss, congenital CMV. So it's really important to collaborate so everyone knows what's happening and then also to share your data. So I do lots of presentations with stakeholders in our state and outside the state too, but with our state just to kind of see what they're what's happening. And it's really exciting with the medical community where we can show, okay, here's our data and our super high hit rate on these high risk factors. What we're finding is SGA and IUGR. A lot of these babies we're, we're finding are positive for congenital CV and sharing that data with them. And so um, that's just a couple of, couple of things I think is important. You know, um, you know, you asked about collaboration, and I think um, I, I do think that early check is a really great example of public health and researcher collaboration, right? In that we, it is a research study, but we are partnered deeply with our state, uh, the state institution that does the newborn screening, and um, you know, I think um, it it really has um, benefited the study immensely. Um, that we're able to have that collaboration with them. Um, and I think, you know, a larger scheme of things is that having those sorts of connections between researchers and public health will really allow, um, will allow this effort to move forward and to make decisions on whether, um, whether targeted or universal screening um, is, 
right for that particular um, a particular situation. Great, thank you so much. Um, and with that, we will close the session. Thank you to our presenters for, I, I feel like we could probably go on for another hour talking about this. And um, so um, really appreciate your comments. Um, thank you to everyone who responded to the polls. Um, it will be very beneficial for us in thinking about our next steps. This is just the start of a conversation, not the end all be all. Um, we will uh, collect the questions that um, have come through the chat. I think there may be just one or two that have come in that we won't get to, um, but we will reach back out to our panelists and have them answer that, and then we will send those um, that information back out to um, everyone who has registered. And lastly, we will let everyone know when the presentation is live, so um, you can go back to it and take a deeper dive. Um, and also, thank you so much to uh, Scott Gross, who just uh, posted some information in the chat. If you would like to learn more about the cost effectiveness or cost analysis, um, you can reach out to him um, uh, and he posted his email there. So thank you so much and um, we will all be in touch soon. Thank you.